Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday afternoon session of our April virtual members meeting. We hope it's our last virtual members meeting, but thank you for joining us. I'll just mention at the start, if you were unable to watch our keynote last night by Indra Nui, it really was a wonderful talk, uh, very warmly received, and you should watch for the video on, on uh, the Society's website. It's, it's well worth watching. But it's my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Julie Flavelle, is an independent historian and fellow of the Royal Historical Society of Scotland. She's a graduate of Bryn Mawr, earned her PhD in history from the University College London. She's lectured in American history various places and she specializes in the American Revolutionary Era. Her research focuses primarily on the American Revolution, specifically when and how Britons and Americans began to think of themselves as separate peoples. And her talk today is based on her most recent book, The Howe Dynasty, The Untold Story of a Military Family and the Women Behind Britain's Wars for America, came out last year. It follows the lives of the Howe family, many of whom were considered Anglo-American heroes by the end of the Seven Years' War in 1763. The story of how, just 12 years later, their role in the American Revolution transformed them into foreigners in a land they had given their blood to defend is told powerfully through the medium of family history. And the book radically recasts the American War of Independence as a civil war by telling it through the eyes of the Howe women. Julie Flavel, over to you. Hello, thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I'm gonna start my talk with a question that I'm often asked at the end of my talks, which is how did I become interested in the hows? And the fact is there's no easy answer to this because my interest in the hows is long standing and it evolved over many years. I grew up in the Boston area where local stories about the American Revolution, of course, abound. And I was always intrigued by the figure of General Howe. Um, he seemed to me like somebody with an unexplored backstory. The redcoat general who, if the stories are true, was so well liked when he arrived in Boston in May 1775 that just a few weeks later he was spared by American sharpshooters on Bunker Hill when they recognized him from behind the rebel barricades. And by 1776, in what was an unusual arrangement, he was commander in chief of the British Army alongside his brother, Admiral Richard Lord Howe. And the impression that the Howe command was somehow a family affair is intensified by the fact that Admiral and Richard, Admiral and General Howe had lost another brother almost 20 years earlier in the American wilderness fighting the French at Fort Ticonderoga. Um, so neither Admiral nor General Howe had the usual profile of a British career officers jumping into the American war to get ahead. And when I came to study the American Revolution as a serious scholar, I discovered that the sense of mystery that I detected about the Howes is a persistent thread in every scholarly work on the Howe Command. For over two centuries, there have been long-standing conspiracy theories surrounding the brothers to the effect that the Howes were deliberately soft on the American rebellion. And these theories have been taken seriously by historians and they've never died down. The fact is that the Howe brothers Share, take the greatest share of the blame in the history books for Britain's failure to win the war because they were in command at a point in the war when the French hadn't yet come in and the American ar army still wasn't up to scratch. Uh, and the British expected the war to be an easy victory. So like any commanders who fail in their objective, they've been accused of all sorts of missed opportunities. But they've also been accused of what's much worse. They've been accused of a deliberate failure to bring the war to, the, to a conclusion by avoiding an all-out confrontation with the enemy. And of course, this smacks of treason. And all sorts of motives have been adduced to account for this supposed backwardness in the service of their country. And, and the sense of mystery about the family was compounded by an accidental fire that occurred a few decades after the close of the American Revolution when all the Howe family papers were destroyed. So military historians have stressed that virtually nothing is known about the private lives of the Admiral and the General. 
beyond the bare facts, their professional lives. So the house seemed like a closed door, but I was led back to them in a very unexpected way. I was looking, I was thinking about writing a sequel to my book, When London Was Capital of America. And in quest of material, I went to the letters of Caroline Howe, the sister of the Admiral and the General, which are in the Spencer paper, papers in the British Library. And I was surprised to find that in a correspondence between Caroline Howe, the sister of the Admiral and the General, and her, her closest friend, Lady Georgiana Spencer, this correspondence went on for about 40 years. There's effectively a treasure trove of Howe family letters. And there's absolutely no doubt that if these letters had been written by a brother of the Admiral and General, they'd have been gone through with a fine tooth comb by now. So in, rather than a sister. So I decided to write a biography of the Howe dynasty, the first ever based on the sisters' letters. Um, although I use other material, but that's the central material. Today, instead of summing up my book in the time I have, I'm going to introduce the three of the women who came alive in my research. And in the process, I'm going to show how much is lost when the biographies of professional men ignore their families and their private lives, because a lot of what was misunderstood about the Howe brothers becomes clear in the context of their families. So first slide, please. Charlotte Viscountess Howe. She was the mother of the generation that included the Admiral and the General. And it was her ambition that turned the Howes into a celebrated military family in the 18th century. She was born in Hanover in 1703. Um, she had royal blood. Her mother, Sophia von Kielmansegg, was the illegitimate half-sister of King George I. So she was effectively George I's niece. And she and her family came to England in 1714 when George III ascended the throne of Great Britain. And she was barely 16 when a few years later she married Scrope Howe, Viscount Howe from Nottinghamshire. This is her wedding portrait when she was just 16. All the house loved dogs, by the way. Um, this was probably not an arranged marriage uh, because Skropow wasn't really a great catch for somebody with royal blood. Uh, his family were relatively poor uh, by the standards of the aristocracy. And he also had an Irish title, which meant that he didn't sit in the British House of Lords. He had to be elected to parliament if he wanted to join the government. Um, and after 16 years of marriage, Scrope died, leaving Charlotte with eight children aged 13 down to a babe in arms. And he also left her with a great deal of debt and the Howe dynastic fortunes were in dire straits. So in order to retrench, the Howe boys were taken out of Eton. Um, the family closed up the estate in Nottinghamshire and they lived with various wealthy relatives for the next few years. And things only changed for Charlotte a few years later in 1743 when she got the only job that was thinkable for a woman of her social rank. And that is she became lady in waiting to Princess Augusta, who was the mother of the future King George III. And at this point, George was a little prince of five years of age. Um, now this position didn't actually pay all that well. And a lot of the money had to be spent on clothing because a court dress was prescribed. You were expected to wear all sorts of velvet, satins, and gold lace. The real value of the post was that it gave her an opportunity to find suitable careers for her son. Suddenly she had connections. And within a couple of years, she'd arranged for William, the future General Howe, to become a page of honor at court. And this was a paying position for teenage boys of genteel families. Um, they, it groomed them for army life. They learned horsemanship and so forth. And, and she, her oldest son, George, became an ensign in the prestigious regiment of foot guards at age 20. Um, her son, Richard, who was a future Admiral Howe, had to start off his sailing career in the Merchant Marine. Next slide, please. This was a step that was unusual for an aristocratic family. The Merchant Marine, the East India Company was considered to be uh, going into trade, which of course was usually considered beneath the aristocracy, but the Howes didn't have the connections to get him into the Royal Navy until a few years later. This is a, a portrait of Richard that's been reproduced for the first time in my book. He was about age 30. It's never been seen before until, you know, I, I found it. It's, it, it's a private, in the private collection of Lord Howe. 
Um, so Richard became a midshipman in 1740 and began his career in the Royal Navy. Now with the start of the Seven Years' War in 1756, which of course is the French and Indian War in America, Charlotte became the ritual head of the dynasty because all the Howe men were overseas serving. And she was in a very influential position because she was a friend of Lady Yarmouth, who was the mistress of King George II. And through her influence, her eldest son, George Augustus, was made a brigadier general in America. And this sadly ushered in the second great tragedy of her life. Next slide, please. This is George and his foot guard regimentals. In 1758, George was killed at Fort Ticonderoga in upstate New York, but in a failed attempt to capture the fort from the French. He was immensely popular. He's been called the most popular British officer ever to serve alongside Americans. And this statement was made in the 20th century. He adopted wilderness fighting techniques and tried to, he, he successfully introduced them into the British army. He ranged alongside of the famous Rogers Rangers in the woods. And after his death, the colony of Massachusetts raised a monument to him in Westminster Abbey. His mother didn't have long to grieve because no sooner did the news of George's death reach England when she had to protect his seat in Parliament. The Howes regarded uh, the parliamentary seat of Nottingham as theirs by right, but, no, but when news of George's death reached England, uh, a predatory political manager, the Duke of Newcastle, tried to install a local favorite into the seat. And this is when Charlotte did something, the only thing that gets her into the history books. Um, she did something very unusual for a woman of her period. She put a piece in the newspaper appealing to the voters of Nottingham to give the seat to her younger son, William. So she went over the head of the Duke and it worked. She used dramatic language that positioned her as a vulnerable female. She wrote, permit me to implore the protection of every one of you, the voters of Nottingham, as the mother of him whose life has been lost in the service of his country. So she, she posed as a, well, it wasn't a pose. She, she was seen then as a grieving matriarch and there was a tremendous outpouring of sympathy and William became MP for Nottingham. And it was such an unusual step for a woman that it was reprinted for years afterwards. Georgian aristocratic women, often were politically active, but if they were, they had to stay strictly behind the scenes. Um, any, any appearance in public at all was very frowned upon and could lead to all sorts of hostility. Um, the, the, the second woman I'm going to talk about is Caroline Howe, whose letters are at the center of my book. She was the oldest daughter of Scrope and Charlotte Howe. And in fact, she was older sister to Admiral and General Howe. And throughout her life, just to reflect the, the attitudes of the period, Charlotte was, uh, Caroline was described as having a mind like a man. She was clever, she liked maths. Um, Benjamin Franklin, who liked her very much, remarked that that was a little unusual in ladies. She was self-educated, she understood Latin, French, Greek, she read widely, but she was also athletic for the time. And in fact, she was the only woman who's listed as a member of the beaver fox hunt at Rutland Castle in, in the century. By the start of the revolution, she was a widow and she lived in a townhouse in Grafton Street, London. Next slide, please. And it was to this house that she'd invite Benjamin Franklin to play a game of chess that would ultimately involve her brothers in the American War of Independence. At this point, Franklin, in 1774, Franklin had been in London for over 10 years as a representative for the several American colonies. And in November of that year, um, six months before the start of the American Revolution, Caroline sent him a challenge to a fellow, uh, a member of the Royal Society who was a friend of hers. Um, and the challenge was that she'd heard that Franklin was a skilled chess player and she fancied she could beat him. That was the words she used. She was very competitive at games. So Franklin came along and he started coming regularly to her house in Grafton Street. The motif of uh, Caroline Howe playing chess with Benjamin Franklin was very popular in the 19th century. And uh, one, of the, one of these is, in, uh, the artist unknown is from an illustration in a book. The publication of Franklin's diary sometimes had images of this uh, Franklin playing chess with Caroline Howe. Um, so Franklin began regularly coming to the house and he thought it was all innocent fun. 
And he discovered eventually that it was actually a cover because what Caroline was doing in gossipy George in London was she was getting her neighbors used to say, seeing the very easily recognizable Benjamin Franklin coming to her door regularly. And suddenly on Christmas day, she asked him, would you like to meet my brother Admiral Howe? And the upshot was that secret talks took place between Franklin and Admiral Howe. Um, and this was on behalf of Lord Dartmouth, who was the only member of the British government who was looking for a peaceful solution to the American crisis at this stage before the war began. And what Howe did was he asked Franklin for proposals that the American thought might satisfy the American leaders in Congress. And as we know, this came to nothing, but Caroline was in on all the meetings and I've discovered through her letters that she was the original link between the Howes and Lord Dartmouth. The Howe brothers didn't know Dartmouth. Caroline knew his wife through charity work and through her, she knew Lord Dartmouth himself. And the secret talks in London eventually became part of the legend of the Howes. Um, rumors that they'd taken place started to spread during the war and loyalists who were angry at the failure of the house to end the rebellion claimed that Admiral Howe had been manipulated by Franklin or that he'd come to some sort of secret agreement with him, something a little more conspiratorial sounding. So the third woman I'm going to talk about isn't a Howe woman. She was Elizabeth Loring, who was famous as the mistress of General Howe. In 1777, uh, by which time it was becoming clear that the American war was stalling and British public opinion began to attack the house, um, newspaper attacks, um, cartoons, all sorts of abuse. And the conspiracy theories I mentioned gained traction. The brothers were accused of deliberately losing a war that the public had been assured couldn't possibly fail and all sorts of motives were pulled out. Um, that they were trying to discredit the government because they secretly supported the government opposition, that they secretly supported the rebels because they had a sentimental attachment to America because of their brother um, who had died at Ticonderoga, uh, that they wanted to prolong the war in order to make money. Next slide, please. And what I'm going to show here, this is a cartoon of the two house um, having a consultation with the devil. To, to work out how to make the war last longer so they can make as much money as possible. And another accusation was that they hoped to gain glory as saviors of the empire. And they thought that by being soft on the Americans, they'd be able to woo them to the bargaining table. That's the one that's lasted longest that historians sometimes take seriously. Um, the central figure in the attacks on William Howe, who was the one who bore the brunt of the attacks, was Elizabeth Loring. And she was a Boston woman he'd met in 1775. And she and her husband, Joshua Loring, were both loyalists. And they came to New York with the Howes in 1776. And Joshua was made commissary of prisoner, prisoners by William Howe. So in early 1777, when the British army found uh, Washington had struck back at Trenton and Princeton and the British army in New York was now on the defensive. The, that was when the rumors began that Mrs. Loring was William Howe's mistress. And it's, they started in letters of loyalists back home to London and then newspaper attacks that were actually taken up by both sides. So both the American Patriot Press and the London Press um, claimed that William Howe had this mistress and that he was dallying with her and um, the, the, one of the phrases that you often hear was he fingered the cash the general enjoyed madam because the idea was that Joshua Loring uh, was complacent about the affair because he, he was being well paid by the British army. Now historians have barely looked into the facts of Mrs. Loring's life, they always assume it's true. And she's usually briefly mentioned in books about William Howe as his mistress. But by looking through the lens of the Howe family, I found it's highly unlikely that she was actually William Howe's mistress. Elizabeth Loring was born in 1752 to a well-to-do family in Long Island. And by the time she met William Howe in May, 1775, she'd married Joshua Loring, who was from a wealthy Massachusetts family. William surely did meet her as soon as he arrived in Boston, which is how the gossip goes. 
but it wasn't because of her flashing blue eyes, supposed flashing blue eyes and blonde hair, because he already knew her family. Her husband, Joshua, had served in the French and Indian War alongside William at Havana, Cuba. And her uncle, more notably, her uncle James Lloyd was a doctor who'd saved William's life, so William believed, in 1758, because William Howe arrived in Boston with the British Army in that year and fell dangerously ill. So he felt he owed his life to Elizabeth Loring's uncle. And when Elizabeth met William, she was four months pregnant, which is, was not, is not an auspicious time to begin a, an affair. And this is a fact that none of the military historians have bothered to look up. Her baby was born in October, 1775, and he was named after the last royal governor of New Hampshire, John Wentworth. John Wentworth had been the employer of Joshua Loring before the war. And the reason this is significant is because the Wentworths knew William's wife, Frances Howe, and they would associate with her when they returned to London during the war. And it's simply unbelievable that William Howe would choose as a mistress, a woman whose friends and family were part of his own circle and knew his wife. And in a day when rank did matter, somebody who was from a respectable middle-class background. There's actually no direct evidence for the affair. What William and Mrs. Loring thought of having their names tied together forever isn't known. Um, but the episode does show an unpleasant misogynistic streak in the attempts to blacken the Howe name. And, and it's by, been by reconstructing William Howe's private world that I've been able to find out more about who Mrs. Loring really was, the wife of a former comrade at arms and the niece of a doctor who saved William's life. I do think, by the way, that William Howe had a lover in New York, but I'll leave that for the book. Um, and final slide, the, just to finish up now, I realize I have to leave time for questions. This is the only surviving portrait of Caroline Howe, and that's in Earl Howe's private collection. And this is her at age 90, and she has before her the London Times, which had only just started being published a few years earlier. And she was a prolific letter writer. So this is a typical picture of her at her desk. I, I think I should stop now for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it, you mentioned it uh, almost at the end of your talk, the, the misogynistic streak in mm. the treatment of uh, Mrs. Loring. And I wonder if you want to broaden that observation a little bit. Uh, you've uncovered fascinating history by, by really turning the lens in the other direction and, and looking at, at the women. Oh, what, what has kept most historians from doing that? Is it misogyny or bad training or? <laughs> or what, what, I, what? I think, okay, I, I think that um, really because the Howe family papers have kind of disappeared, um, people who write about the Howes are usually military historians. And they're looking at official papers. And actually, I, they seem relieved to me when they write all the family papers are gone and they quickly turn away from anything to do with the house personal lives, you know, after declaring that there's almost nothing that's known. And I, I actually do find it surprising, but they simply haven't even bothered to look into the facts of Mrs. Loring's life, life to any great extent at all. Um, her son, John Wentworth Loring, is in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. So all they had to do was look up Loring in the ODNB <laughs> and discover that she was four months pregnant when she met William Howe, but they've never, never do it. And so I don't know if misogyny is too strong a word, but I think there's a, there's a certain arrogance um, that, that this woman who is constantly linked with William Howe, but no one's really bothered to look into her. And there are no surviving letters from her as an adult. So she's not been able to say a word about all this. But, but from all signs, she appears to have been happy, happily married. Her husband um, rejoined her in England you know, after the war. She, she went over in 1778 to England and settled in Hampshire. And her husband joined her. And they had several more children before he died. And um, you know, she, she died in, in, in a very old age and seemed to be a very respectable person. How, how translatable do you think your observations about, you know, look, look at the women, read the women's papers uh, are to 
other parts of history that you've encountered in, in, in your own training and your own work? Well, I think that, I, I mean, my, my feeling is that um, people, when people write about famous women, I mean, to take a very well-known example, Queen Elizabeth I, they always intertwine their personal and, and, and public lives. When they write about famous men, they often think they don't have to bother and that it's, and that it's just a choice they make. You know, if they decide to write a lot about, um, you know, Roosevelt's personal life or they can, they can leave it out and just write about him as a public person. And, and I think that, that a huge amount is missed that way, actually. And I hope that my book shows that. Um, and, and, but I think, I think one of the reasons women subjects in biography are often so interesting is precisely because people try to get under their skin and write about their personal life too. And, you know, maybe when people are writing about leading male figures, they should take a leaf out of this book and take it much more seriously. Cause I think people miss things. And I think my book really shows that they miss motives that men have. They miss exactly who they knew, who was influencing them and so forth. We have a couple of questions I'll combine because um, they aim at the same, at the same thing. Uh, uh, Mary Claire King asks, I realize it's getting ahead of your story, but could you tell us about the Loring Howe relationship after the war? And David Maxey asks, what happened to the house after the revolution? Okay, yeah. Um, well, Loring Howe, disappointingly, there's, there's almost nothing. Um, the Lorings did, did apply for um, loyalist compensation and pensions, which was the usual thing to do. And there's at least, I know there are some documents that were signed by William Howe saying, you know, yes, they had indeed, you know, he had served during the war, she was indeed his wife, but they don't appear to have had any actual contact with the Lorings at all. Uh, the Loring boys all entered, um, a couple of them entered the army and the Navy and they did very well. And it could be that the Howes um, used some of their connections to help the boys. But if they did, there'd be nothing unusual in that. That was, it was common for um, aristocratic families to help uh, middle-class families who, who were associated with them. But basically there was no real, there was no contact afterwards. I can say that the Howes didn't believe the story I should say they did not believe the story about Mrs. Loring because I, I was kind of thrilled to find a letter of a woman named Jane Strakey who was sitting at a drawing room in London in, in early 1777. And she said, I was sitting in this drawing room. She was a friend of Lady Howe's and she suddenly heard someone calling across the room about this affair General Howe was supposedly having with Mrs. Loring. And this, this friend of the house tried to look unconcerned um, and made some comment about, well, he's very far from his wife, you know, the double standards of the day. But in fact, subsequently, she said, I don't believe a word of this story. And her husband supported that. And Fanny Howe appeared, you know, the, William's wife. There's no sign that any of them believed it. Sorry, you know, no, you had another question. Uh, yes, Jack Raykov has a question. <clears throat> One theme of your book is that British officials, including the Howes, were unwilling to recognize the Continental Congress as the institution with whom they would have to deal if there was ever to be any negotiation over the revolution. On that basis, the Howe brothers could not make any real progress with their peace commission. Do you think they were privately critical of that decision? Yes, <laughs> I think they were, yes. <laughs> I, 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 and I think they were really irritated when the Carlisle Commission was able to recognize the Congress and they were thinking, well, you know, if this had happened a number of years ago, um, because I think they, they agreed with people like Edmund Burke, who thought that, that, that the Congress should at least be convened as a one-off and allowed to be used as a basis for thrashing something out with the colonies. Um, you know, I think, and in fact, I think Richard was very frustrated with the limits of his commission. And this is purely my opinion, but, I think the reason Richard accepted the Peace Commission was because his brother was already over there. They were a very, very close family. And I, I think, I mean, there weren't exactly people clamoring to be Peace Commissioner. And I wonder whether, my impression is that Richard, because he was so frustrated with how little he could wrest out of the government for concessions, uh, that if he, if he had had, if he hadn't felt he needed to go over and support his brother, he probably would have backed off from the thing at some point in 1775. I hope that answers the question. 
and a question from Mary Beth Norton. Can you expand on the general role of, of aristocratic women in 18th century British politics? How typical was Caroline Howe? Well, I, I think Caroline Howe was very typical. She had an aunt. Uh, and, and I have to say first, not all aristocratic women got involved in politics by any means. Um, some chose to, and there were families that had traditions of being involved in politics. Um, for example, you know, of course, the Spencers and the Duchess of Devonshire was um, Lady Spencer's daughter. And they they had a tradition of, the, the, in some families, the women were groomed to, you know, support men in, in the political world. And they, so it was a family tradition. And the house were like that. They had an aunt, Lady Pembroke, who was lady in waiting to Queen Caroline. And she was very politically active she made sure that that George Howe was elected to Parliament while he was overseas, and she she did she even went in and canvassed from a coach uh, on on his behalf at the at during the elections. Um, so I think Caroline, the, the woman who's always brought out for the 18th century, is the Duchess of Devonshire, who went around um, shaking people's hands and and you know, famously kitch, kissing butchers and so on in order to get votes for Charles James Fox. But she was actually very atypical because she was so out there. But but to be behind the scenes, to influence uh, people being who, who was chosen as candidate for MP, um, to get involved to, to some extent in advising about policy with um, very influential male members of the family. There were, there were quite a few women who did that. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I think Lady Rockingham, um, George III sometimes recommended that she be asked about things involving Lord Rockingham because she was so, he regarded her as having extremely good judgment and being very influential with her husband. Uh, but, but this was in a world where, because it was a very small world and it was the, the political world was dominated by 10,000 families at most. You know, proximity is power. So women who belonged to these powerful families were, were simply able to have a kind of influence. Um, I, I, think, I think nowadays, I, I sometimes think that Carrie Simon, Carrie Johnson, I should say, would have been you know, very comfortable in the 18th century. You may know about the, the accusation that she pokes it into her husband's politics too much. But to me, the things she's accused of doing, whether it's true or not, I don't know, are very typical of, of a woman 200 years earlier in Georgian England, and she wouldn't have been criticized then. We could make some other comments about uh, wives of prominent individuals getting involved in politics, but we'll suspend that and we'll thank you for this very interesting talk.